Well, good morning, you lovely people. It's a beautiful day. Um, autumn is definitely on the way. And thank you and welcome for joining us on this Builders Masterclass. Now, if you're going to send me a message now that says, I'm at work, I can't do this. I can't watch. My boss is checking me out. Psst, don't worry. Reduce the screen. Bottom left. Earphones in. You can still watch. Or, instead of getting caught, you can watch it later. Because it's live. It's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, whatever platform you're choosing. And you can then come back to it later. Like this evening. And put it on the big screen at home. Big, like F1, Formula One. Yeah, that thing. Guys, uh, there, there are lots of ways. So if you... if if you're, a bit, if you're only going to watch half or a bit of it and you've got something else to do, then, then fear not. Fear not. It's okay. Um, so, hello to all of you guys who are here and those who are bunking um, joking work. Excellent. All right. Shirley, good morning from a very hot and dry Bryanston, guys. I have heard your temperatures are through the roof. Um, I'm up that way next week, so I, yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm looking forward to the heat. We are going to be in a tent, um, which is, yeah, which is going to make, maybe they should have a slip and slide there, you know, or like an ice cream van. If the organisers are listening, um, that's called an RHT, a red hot tip, to make your visitors um, a bit more comfortable in that very big hot tent. Mm, anyway, um, uh, Christina, you're very naughty, corrupting the work folk. Ah, oh, come on, tell me that you don't do it. Come on. <laughs> good morning, Yvashdi. Good morning, Meliska. Uh, Terry Lee, good morning from the, the team up just beyond OR Tambo Airport. Um, Super Cesar, good morning. Um, Shirley, yes, from the Hot Bryanston. Um, Yonita, good morning. Um, and assistance. Ah, I'm glad that you know that there are assistants because I've got one, two, three, four, five, five sets of eyeballs staring at me. Uh, one with the camera in tow, uh, another two cameras in front there, someone with a big white flag that insists that I need to look at this camera or else I'm talking to nobody. And I do that quite often, standing and talking into an abyss. Um, but they are really amazing. I've got a cord handler and, and keep Tanya sane handler. Um, and I've got another handle at the back there to make sure that I'm on the right screen and know what I'm talking about, which I often get wrong. And then I've got the master of all things amazing there. He's the one that, come on, Warwick, work with me. Flick in between. Flick. 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 You see, you see, he's the one who jumps up and in, in between all these screens so that um, when I'm going to pull a funny face, he makes sure that he's... Really on the close-up. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we've got an entire team here who, who really are my support and my rock. Um, but I thank you for saying good morning to them. Um, uh, Sharon, good morning. A uh, long time no see. Where you been? Where you been? Where you been here? Hi, Bo. Okay. Maureen, good morning. Um, and Christina, hello from Pretoria. Geraldine, work from Pretoria. Hello, guys. Hello, hello, hello. Right. So, sure, we're talking a topic that is really close to my heart. Um, uh, and, yeah, it's amazing. It, it, it is amazing because there, there could be a qualifier needed on, on this. Uh, growing up on the south coast of KwaZulu-Natal, we were surrounded with these plants. All day, every day. They were as common as mud. Like fleas on a uh, whatever. On a dog's back. I wanted to say a flea ridden whatever. Let's not go there. So, um, they were severely common. And I grew up with these things. And these plants. What are we talking? Tropical plants. So, I kind of like, eh, meh, meh. And I used to, at some point in my little life, I really didn't like them. I, I seriously, and I voiced that very firmly um, to some of my colleagues and people who I interacted with. So I will ask for forgiveness when I say that my, my attitude and my love 
has done a full 360. True story, true story. Um, and I guess when you remove from something and you get to see it with different eyes, um, because we now live in a climate which does keep tropical plants okay, it is okay for them. Some of you live in areas where they really need a bit of extra TLC, especially if you're in a frost zone. So it's amazing when we can't have something, when it can't grow, when we can't have what we want, and I'm talking metaphorically on all levels of life, we want it. Funny that, eh? The human mind. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. What does the child do? Touch that. Don't open the cupboard door. Don't open the cupboard door. Open the cupboard door. You cannot grow that plant in Pretoria. You cannot grow that plant in Limpopo. You cannot grow that plant on the south coast. What do we do? We grow the plant. Of course we do. We are masters of our own disaster. Um, and, and hopefully at the end of all this, you will have some kind of guidance on what plants to use that are going to perform, whether you're living in Pofada or Pretoria or Pennington. Um, and this will give you, hopefully, the guidelines so that you have no natural disasters in your back garden. What am I talking about, a natural disaster? Well, that's when you take the wrong plant for the wrong place. Or is it the right plant for the wrong place? <laughs> ah, we could argue this point forever. <laughs> but always remember, always remember with anything in life, whoever you meet, whoever you interact with, whoever your boss is, um, whoever your colleagues are, you've always got to ask one question from whence they came. What is the blueprint of that person? What is the blueprint of that plant? Where did the plant originate from? Did it come from the highlands? Did it come from India? Did it come from the tropics in the jungle? Did it come from the desert? Was it found in the outskirts of Mexico where it grows? It, is that not vital information? I guess it's probably like when you start dating someone. You want to find out the real important information. Because when you get back home, or you make the phone call to your BFF, you know what's gonna go down. What do they do? Um, where's their work? Do they have a car? What's their house like? Um, do they have a mother-in-law? Have you met her? What's she like? Is he good looking? What's his bank balance? Does he have a horse? Yeah, you, you're going to get to know these things. You want to know. Do they like their cup of tea with one sugar, with no sugar, weak, strong? Because the more you get to know the person, the more you interact with them and the more you find out about them, the more you are prepared. Prepared with knowledge, foresight, empathy, understanding to make the relationship work. True. So I hate green peppers. I, well, I don't hate them. I just can't eat them. Because a green pepper, yellow pepper, a red pepper, if you've got a pink pepper, I can't eat it. Because I just have many happy returns for several days afterwards. All I taste is peppers. So if you want to get to know me, don't feed me green peppers. Um, and if there are certain plants that really like growing in the shade, don't put it in the sun. Because you're going to kill it. And it might never befriend you ever again. And, and I guess that's the bottom line. Um, us humans and plants all require very, very similar approaches and how we deal with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, let's see who else is here. Jenny, good morning, good morning. Um, Maria, good morning from Three Rivers Vereniging. Ja, dat word baie, baie koud daar. Um, and Debbie, good morning, Debbie, from Leisure Bay. Um, and Mosiba Butsa, good morning. Uh, Helen, good morning. Jean from Waterfall. Courtney, uh, flee. Oh, oh, oh. Courtney, you naughty. Courtney, why have you got British Airways as your profile thing? Hmm, interesting. Courtney says, a flea ridden politician. 
never wrote that. I just said it. <laughs> oh, girl. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get going. Now, importantly, I was talking to you about from whence they come. And um, we can be very, very, very grateful, very grateful to the plant hunters from the 17th century, I mean, I mean 1700s, uh, 1739, even earlier, seven, 1720s, who were the brave, curious, adventurers of the time who wanted to go and find where the earth ended, who were after the most amazing plants in the world. And guys, it was very much like, in terms of where it sat in society, where this hierarchy sat, there were the very wealthy, not much has changed. Um, there were the very wealthy and then there were uh, somewhere in the middle, I don't know, if, and then there were the very poor. Generally, it was wealthy and poor. And, uh, and there were very few privileged who could have the amount of resources to go and find these plants. Of course, these, it was almost seen as a step in society. If you, sir, whoever, could introduce a new plant into the country, it was a big thing. Seriously, they'd have like big banquets, big, um, big, uh, like big parties, it was named, it was sent to the herbarium, it was a hell of a thing. Okay, but of course they didn't go hunting for it, no, they sent other people. They sent other people to go to the jungle, to get bitten by mosquitoes, eaten by saber-toothed tigers, drowned in rivers, um, get dysentery and everything, because many of them died, these plant hunters died. Oh, they got captured by... The people eating people in the jungles and get put into a three-legged pot. True story. <laughs> True story. It was wild out there. Wild. However, those famous, famous um, plant hunters of the world, uh, Sir David Banks, um, uh, sorry, Sir Joseph Banks, Thomas Cook, um, they were, and there's a list of them and they're legendary, they were the ones who brought us these beautiful plants. These plants, which came from the jungles, were introduced to us, somehow ended up growing indoors as an indoor plant. Wow! But remember, it does originate from a jungle. And those are the most important things that we need to think about when we are talking about tropical gardens, because most of them are from that spot in the world. Um, so, in terms of caring for them, looking after them, watering, what they like, what they don't like, just put yourself in the jungle. Think about it. Hot, humid, with lots of rainstorms, almost every afternoon. When you walk, it's squishy underneath. It's squishy. It's got a beautiful mold, a leaf mold, mulch, because no one rakes up the leaves in the jungle. True story. <laughs> so, yes, um, our tropical plants very much cross over to our house plants, which we so love and cherish. And I, I have to say that the craze of indoor house plants and new plant parents has really just kind of amped up the whole thing for us to have more selection and more plants that we can choose from. Is it difficult to do? Absolutely not. There are a few very, very simple things that we need to take care of. And I'm going to start with the basics before I go into what's out there. Because if we don't get the base right, if we don't get the basics right, guys, you can do whatever you want. You can plant whatever you want. She ain't going to be happy. Very simple. It's not going to be happy. It's like building a house. You use the wrong concrete mix. Or your builder runs away with 50 bags of cement that should have gone into the foundation. Mmm, the house you are going to crack. Mmm, mm mmm, okay. So it's all about what we do there. And guys, the prep, I know we all get so excited about the planting. Ooh, we get so excited and invariably we run out to builders and we buy all the plants and we haven't even prepared the garden bed. And then when you start, you realize, oh, this job's quite big. <laughs> ah, 
<laughs> so do your preparation first. Get it done right. Because whatever you do then will determine the outcome. It, 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 it's a basic law of nature. Okay, so your soil. Most times, and I'm going to say this most times, is that the areas where you're wanting to create a tropical garden, because a lot of the time it's under trees. Yeah, it's under trees because a lot of them are shade loving. So we resonate towards a shaded area in our garden and automatically an obstacle comes in our way. Mm. Trees. And the reason why we generally go there is because there is nothing growing under the tree. It's a bare patch. So why is nothing growing under the tree? Because you haven't planted it? No, because it's actually quite difficult to grow things under trees. Why? Because there's competition with the roots. Okay, so when you start digging, when that spade bounces back up at you and hits you on the head, when you're, when you're first putting it in, or the garden fork, you will soon realize that there is an entire tapestry and maze of very, very fine roots under that tree. So most important is preparation. When we talk about prep, dig it up. And guys, when you start digging up and you're getting all these fine root hairs, your tree is not going to fall down, please. It's not going to fall down unless you start taking away the big feeder roots because with the tree, you'll have the tree, you'll have the big feeder roots coming off, which are the stakes, the stays, they hold it in place and then off that, off the anchor roots, I beg your pardon, and then off that are the very fine feeder roots and sometimes they're like this mesh, you like literally pick it up and, and it, it almost looks like, uh, mm, like when you're walking on the beach and you pick up a bit of uh, coral or, or something that's washed up, it's that matted, veined. So you've got to get rid of that. Um, and you've got to add in loads of goodness. So what is the loads of goodness that you've got to add in? Guys, it's, it's very, very simple. And um, choose what you want, but just do something. Just, just do this. Uh, whether you're going to be adding in um, bone meal, whether you're going to be adding in some 315 organic in your prep. Okay, so this would be uh, a large handful per square meter dug into at least a fork's depth. Mm, that's quite deep. Oh, yes, baby. Or if you're going to use something like our root builder, which you're going to also, you could add these two together because they work very well together, uh, very happily. So uh, choose it and use it, guys. So I would actually combine both of them to give an extra bit of oomph. Um, and remember, if you're dealing with a a area of the garden which when you start digging and you start seeing it's dry the, the the soil is very is very sandy you can see that when you do apply water it just runs off it's typical it's typical typical um, also you will find these similar conditions down the side of the house okay where the eaves overhang that area of garden is normally really poor soil so we've got to feed the soil improve the soil structure, what are we trying to do? Remember back, we're trying to create that jungle soil, that soft, squishy, beautiful, moist jungle soil. So add in loads of compost, okay, a good quality compost from your local builders. Look out for the Garden Master range. It's a great, great product. Um, it's heavy. You're going to have two hands. You're going to need two hands to carry that bag of compost to the car. Uh, but it's good stuff. Into your soil, you can also add some palm peat. And we do this often. In the garden just behind me, which is our shade garden, um, we have added in this every time we plant. We add a thick layer on top, dig it in, turn it into the soil because, of course, this adds beautiful organic matter, and it also helps to hold the moisture once we have put the plant in. The other thing that we add in, and we've spoken about this so many times, guys, so you should know the drill of this by now. Uh, for you newbies, um, if you don't know about this product, I seriously believe that you need to go, go back on any of the Facebook Lives and go and check it out, or go onto the Builder's blog, because we've got... Um, on the YouTube channel, we've got an entire video just about this. Guys, it's called Hydro Cash. It will save your plants from near death and disaster, especially if they are growing in poor soil. And this, as a water retaining gel, not only saves the plant, but it also saves you water in the long run. 
ha, which is very scarce indeed. Finally, as we are preparing the soil, get hold of hopefully your own homemade compost. Look at this beautiful stuff. And this is just, this is kind of like in between stage. Um, it's not fully composted yet, but this is where you can start adding. Because look, it's got the leaves that are starting to break down it. It's almost, we're almost getting to a soil base here. Beautiful organic content. Smells like a forest. Seriously. This smells like a forest. And you're adding this to the soil. You are going to add this. Which means that you are going to have that perfect recipe for what you need. Okay. That is prep, guys. That is it. Rake it over and get ready to plant. So, from where does our inspiration come? Um, guys, I've put together something. I see there... Um, oh, what, what's up with the sound breaking all the time? Oh, Maureen, I think that's your thingy. Mm, there's a monkey hanging on your Wi-Fi line. <laughs> ah! Oh, oh, my word. Okay, um, guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go across. Uh, we put together um, some slides for you to just give you the inspiration that you need. And... This, my friends, is what I hope is going to give you a bit of guidance if you are thinking of a new area. Okay, is it not coming up? No, look at that. What do I do? Slideshow. Uh, play from start. Is that what I do? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, I pushed the right button. Push button facts. Okay, guys, let's get to it. When considering an area for tropical gardening, it very much lends itself to the contrast of hard landscaping. Because your tropical plants are generally big-leaved, large-leaved, quite vibrant, and they powerful. They like stop you in your tracks and say, look at me, look at me, look at me. So you do want to maximize that space. So consider what you are going to combine it with. Is it just going to be a few shrubs thrown in the corner of the garden or literally thrown under the tree? No. Put down a few pavers. Maybe create a little raised bed. Consider the colours that you are going to use. And I'm going to... Where's my pointy pen here? Uh, there's my pointy pen. Mm, mm, mm. No, maybe not. Oh, hold on. We're going to get to my pointy pen if I can make it point. Um... Consider the colours that are used. Um, do you see the, the colour of the raised wall at the back here? Because generally you're looking... Oh, there it is. Oh, I got it. Oh, oh, look at that. No, did I? Yes! Ah, there it is. Check the red dot, guys. Don't let the cat attack it. So consider the colour that you're using because generally your tropical gardens will be in a bit of a dark spot. It will have low light. So... Think about your final colour. Here, it is a light colour. And what does the light colour do? Yeah, it makes it more inviting. It just lifts the mood a bit. So very, very, it's one thing that I really do want you to consider. But work with the textures. Include a space for something. That's not just all the plants. Textures are so, so important. And here... Uh, and we're going to get onto this um, a, a lot more in depth a little bit later. But when we talk about textures, look at this arum lily. Ah, perfect. Large, bold textures against fine leaf textures. Tall, upright against low growing. What are we doing? We're playing with contrasts here, guys. When we play with contrasts, that creates the punch. Don't be scared to add in a bit of color. Don't be scared. When you look at this, close your eyes. Open your eyes, look at the picture again. All you see is the yellow pot. I love it. Don't be scared. Um, to add in a bit of that tropical flair, a bit of that Jamaican fun, add it in and don't be scared. Because if you don't like the colour or you get bored of it, it's just literally a coat of paint. Palms are a wonderful cheat treat. And I say this when we think about tropical gardens, 
tropical paradise. Come on, come on. What comes into your head? Yeah, I'm with you. White beach, lounger, cocktail, underneath the palm tree without coconuts to fall on my head. Yeah, come on. That's what we've all got. That's the picture. Hold on. Oh, and then a fan. Oh, and then waving the waiter. Oh, another oh, Ross, please. Um, not quite. That's what we think about palms. We think about palms because why? It's the natural association. But guys, besides the fact that yes, they are amazing in tropical gardens, what I love the most is they are like a pink ticket to cheat. <laughs> why? Because you can pop into your local builders and buy a palm tree that's already two meters high. Yeah, it's like been growing because palms don't have a big root system. They've got a very uh, a clump forming, a very compacted uh, root system. So they can grow in a black plastic nursery bag, which we call it a black plastic, a black polyethylene sleeve, actually, that's what they're called, those black bags. But you can get a palm that's really tall. So if you want to create some heart in an area, you just get three palms, bang, bang, bang. Oh my gosh, I've been growing there for 10 years. Look at that, Moira, look at it. Lovely, lovely. So you have a ticket to cheat, which is amazing. And palms just give you that feeling, man. And you can attach hammocks to them. You've got height in your garden. Uh, you've got structure immediately. And then you can play. Okay. So don't, don't forget them. Large leaves, beautiful contrasts. Have a look at this beautiful monstera here. I mean, Spectacular. Uh, and this is where you can really have fun. Consider your seating area as well, please. And I touched on this right in the beginning, but don't add that then right at the end. Keep this in your planning. Think about it. Benches, decks, and of course, what can we put up the trees? And especially if you've got the palms or you've got existing trees, they your, your, your scope of your creativity can really go wild. Whether you are hanging plants from the trees as kokodamas, whether you are attaching the beautiful, I mean, look at these. Oh, come on. Look at those beautiful stag horns. Hey, aren't they gorgeous? Whether you're attaching them to trees, um, you're getting that look and feel. And remember, your, your stag horns, Give them a banana. If you've got one banana that's busy going off or going frot, take it and just stick it into those leaves just behind where it joins um, the palm or the tree because when it rots, it produces, you know that smell of rotting banana? It produces a plant hormone which is called ethylene. That's the smell of rotting bananas, which staghorns love, love it. It's like giving it a spa treatment. Okay, rotten banana, spa treatment. Never thought I'd say that. Anyway, um, and my goodness, there are such beauties available in, in, the, um, in the staghorns and, and you really can get very creative. Walls, if you don't have a big garden, could also be turned into your tropical paradise. Here, it's very simple, guys. This is dead simple. This is like DIY, easy. Strips of bamboo attached onto it, a little mirror. We've added a, a staghorn over there. Plastic two-liter bottles attached with a cable tie and some lovely tropical cascading plants. Easy, simple. To water this, stand with your sprayer and just water it. Um, of course, plant options, and we're going to go into this in depth now. But they're vivid, they're bright, they're bold, and they call for your attention. And never forget about the addition of other textures. So we spoke very early about the wall and the wall color. And look here, just, just look on this right here. Look at how powerful the light colored rocks, the light rocks are against the deep green foliage. Okay, it makes you stop, it makes you look. And plants, pathways, this plant over here on the right, Helomnia oh, are spectacular, and you also get them in other colors with yellow specks and green leaves. Oh, um, no, it's not a Helomnia, it's, it's Lobularia. Lobularia, which also loves the shade. Now, uh, 
you're going to say to me, guys, okay, oh gosh, all oh, Clivia's, Clivia's, Clivia's. Okay, let's not get started on that. We need an entire masterclass for that. Um, but yes, Clivia's. And funny enough, they don't mind growing under the trees most of the time, as long as you're going to give them a good, good watering. Always consider the addition of water because the addition of water really does just sum it up. Um, and I'm going to zoot through these guys because I've got a lot to cover. But consider textures, colors, plants for height. Look, look at the cycas here. Plants for height, cycas revoluta, which is the Japanese sago palm, uh, which you don't need a permit for, uh, which will give you beautiful height. And all our stunning bromeliads. Okay. And finally, one of the plants which I believe needs to be in every tropical garden is this guy over here, and it's called agave. Um, it's called agave tenuata, and it is almost, it is a true agave, but it's got a more fleshy leaf. It's more tropical looking, more squishy, and it's bold and beautiful and really creates such an impact. Such, such an impact. Okay, so there's some yummy eye candy for you to think about what you're going to be doing in your garden. Um, and now I'm going to show you what to use. So when you are out there and you are choosing plants, guys, consider the following. Okay, this thing won't go away, but anyway, I'm leaving it there. So let's start with what's going to give you the structure. What is going to give you the structure in this garden? And always think about that first. So we spoke about the palms. Now, guys, there, there, there are so many different options. And whether you're going to go for something tall and narrow, like this, which is called the Cifritzia palm, okay, Cifritzia, this guy is multi-stemmed, okay, you can see, multi-stemmed, grows narrow and upright, um, and is great for a small garden. And you know, the beauty about palms is that you can plant them really close to the house. Close to the house, close to a water feature. Uh, you can plant them close to foundations, like I said, because they've got that ball root system. They don't have one big tap root that goes down and is going to start ripping up things. But Sofritzia, I love it. And it actually does incredibly well as an indoor plant as well, especially the multi-stemmed. Um, this over here and is also really one that in terms of, and this is, this is Verchefia and it's got this beautiful triangular, look at that, and look at the yellow on it. Consider, consider your choices guys, please consider your choices. And if you are living in an area where you are going to get frost, remember, Remember, remember that you don't need to fear because all you need to do is add when we know we're getting into the cooler times and we know that we are heading into frost season. Remember to wrap your babies up with frost cover. Remember, guys, because the frost cover, double layer it, uh, make sure it's tucked in at the bottom so no cold air gets in. And remember that your plants can continue growing. You don't have to take the frost cover off every day. You don't. You can leave it over there, and then you can take it off when you have the time. But you don't have to take it off. But this will most certainly protect um, your youngsters. Okay, other things for height. Come along here. Wow, and now we start getting into serious, delicious territory. These are the tree ferns. The tree ferns are known. You saw them in the slides. Now remember, there are fast-growing tree ferns. <laughs> There are very slow growing tree ferns, some that you might wait a lifetime to see. So be careful which one you choose. And I am going to give you an example of one exactly here. Now, now this tree fern is called Dixonia antarctica. Dixonia antarctica. Think about the name, Dixonia antarctica. Comes from the cooler regions. Ah which means it's not going to frost, which also means it's going to be really slow growing. This plant here, I reckon it's easily five years old, easily, yeah. So if you want a fast growing tree fern, you use the Australian tree fern. That's the one that you can buy like this big at your local builders and they've got that tall stem and they have that, that you know, you, you saw it in one of those slides. Beautiful, quick-growing fast. Group them in threes, 
group them in fives to create that instant height and get that canopy. That is a quick cheat and they work beautifully. So consider the type of tree fern that you're putting in. Very important. You do get beautiful dwarf ones. Oh, and I love this guy. This is called Blechnum Gibbum. Um, Blechnum is lovely. It's a dwarf tree, um, a dwarf tree fern, nice and compact, lovely concentric foliage and lush and yummy, yummy, yummy. Okay, look at this boy. I mean, come on. And you know, don't, 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 don't ever forget about the marvels of nature. Just look at that. Look at that. The colour, the leaves unfolding, the bronzes, even the red in the vein. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? And if I took that and imagined close by, if I had a beautiful croton growing. <gasps> look at those colours, look at the textures. And this is where I want you to really go out and play. Because here we've got tall, spindly, thin leaves, and here we've got bold, in your face, colorful foliage. And that's where we create those contrasts that we're looking for. Always, always keep an eye on that. So that's what we would look at in terms of tree ferns. There's one more fern I want to show you. Come along over here. And guys, we are really blessed that today, because we live in this global village, we can get access to ferns from all over the world. Um, and this one over here is actually one, uh, it, it's a relative of the leather leaf fern. Um, it, it's, it's one of our indigenous ones, but it's only been available for like the last, I don't know, last few years. But come look at it here. Come look here. Look at that. Look at that color. It's the yellow tipped leather leaf fern. Isn't it beautiful? Look at that. It's like a fairyland. I seriously expect somebody to be jumping up and around here. I'm sure they're here somewhere. <laughs> and look at the tips of that foliage. And that is where we get to play and discover the marvels of these amazing tropical plants. I just love these. A woodland plant, low, and they call it the leather leaf fern. And sometimes you will also know it as the seven day fern. Look at that, ladies and gentlemen. Come on now. <laughs> Isn't that? Look, 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 no, look there, there, there. And two pow. Okay, yes, I would spend most of my day lying on my back looking up at the fern because. The most beautiful, sexiest part is underneath. Uh, this is nature, guys, in her absolute glory. So, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing? <laughs> okay, so you're all going to want to know the name of it, so I'm going to give it to you. It's called the Gold Back, Gold Back Leather Leaf Fern. Boom, shake the room. Okay, now, um, if we are going to be creative and if we want to work with plants, we need to think about these combos. So very quickly, Jesus, it's a bit hot in here. I'm sweating. Okay, I want to show you a typical combo that I would use, a typical combo. Also, when we're talking about height, just before I get onto that, never, ever, ever forget. And unfortunately, guys, most times you are only going to find them in the indoor section or right down by the shade section of your local builders. Okay, these are called alocasias. We've seen these big boys in the garden. Man, these leaves get as big as an elephant's ear. <laughs> True story. Um, I mean, look, look, look at that. Look at that. Look at that marvel. Look at the texture. Look at the size of this leaf. So, when we start playing with things like this, um, and alocasias, once they're in, they grow really, really fast. And they've got a corm. So in here is a corm. You can divide them really quickly once it's got more stems. Dig it out, chop it off, plant another one in another part of the garden. Nice and easy. Okay, so when we're talking, playing with what we've got. Remember, if we had a tree fern here, and if we used some of our beautiful croton, Take a look, beautiful croton against there. What could I use then to pick up colors around here? Well, several, several, several things. So what I could use here is there, I could add in 
ooh, some beautiful bromeliads. Now, before you start telling me that um, they're going to bring all mosquitoes and that, you can just apply Margaret Roberts mosquito um, insecticide there, which you actually just put into the little hole in the cone over here where it holds the water. But I'm getting a feeling that I've got a bit too much red here. So this is what I would do. I would still keep that as the intermediate plant. I would place that there. But then I would go with something like this. Stay where you are, Mason. Whilst I'm coming back to you. I would rather include something like this. I would have this in the foreground, my bromeliads, which are nice and low. I would then add in a break in texture. Oh, look what happens. A break in texture with the fine leaves of this beautiful carex, bold leaves of the croton, and then the height of the tree fern in the back. Nice and easy. Okay, nice and easy. Another trick that I want you to consider. We're going to go across to that side. Mason, we're going to hit over here because I really want to show this to you. And this, this, guys, is one of the classic tricks that you need to use when you are creating a tropical garden. And I'm going to use the following plants to demonstrate it. And whether it, this is in the sun or whether it's in the shade, because these plants can thrive in both conditions. And I just want to see what I'm going to use. In fact, I'm going to use this. So I'm going to use my beautiful fern in the background. That's that yellow bomb. Okay. Now, if we had to use this lovely Altananthra as a ground cover. Okay, this is Purple Prince. Altananthra Purple Prince as the ground cover. If I then went with... Yeah, come here. Oh, mine, mine, caramba. Look at it. The beautiful philodendron prince of orange. Look at it. Okay, do you see what we're doing here? Do you see the contrasts and textures? They really make each other pop. This on its own looks great. Yeah, beautiful. But when I do that, all of a sudden, everything starts jumping. But beyond that, and I do have to hold it at an angle, but beyond that, when I then add this, which would be in my foreground, do you see that combo? Do you see what a white does? The white, because normally we're gardening in quite a dark shaded area, but when we are add the white into it, all of a sudden it lifts it. Without the white, look again, guys. Without the white, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's okay. It's quite powerful. But when I bring that in, oh, caramba, bang, it jumps. Okay. It just jumps. And further to that, I'm going to hold that there and there. And if we wanted to take it one step further, if we then just introduced a little bit of white begonias, which is a lovely annual that will grow either in semi-shade, um, or even into deep shade. If I add a little annual into there, immediately I'm getting that lovely grouping. All right. Other ways of incorporating it and bringing in color is, of course, not only with flowers, but with the foliage, because that's where I really want you to play. That is where you get to have the fun. Likewise, if I had to take... And I'm not too sure, gosh, because I've got so many options here. I'm actually going to go, um, and I'm going to go with this here. I'm going to show you here in terms of combinations. And all I want to do is, I'm, I'm literally just adding to this, guys. This is a caprosma, which is a beautiful, beautiful shrub. Um, and your caprosmas can grow in full sun or in the semi-shade. They've got that texture, but quite dark. So... If we take this, and if I had to take the fern out, if I had to take the fern out, and I brought this in, just to pick up a bit on that orange. Do you see what we're doing? We're playing with the pinks and the oranges. Okay. If I did that, I incorporated the beautiful foliage of my coleus. Okay. And then, just to pick it up, just to pick up the pinks, I used the little polka dot plant, which is a great ground cover. These are the velvety textures that we want to bring in. 
the contrast against these large leaves, which are just so powerful and so impactful. Um, I just simply can't get enough of them, cannot get enough of them. So always something to consider, always, always. What other plants can we use? Okay, guys, there are a lot of them that are available to us and one that I really do want to show you. I mean, come on, look at this, darling. Now that <laughs> is a wicked plant. This is a indigenous plectranthus. Um, it's insane. It gives you a flower. It can grow in full sun. It can grow in semi-shade. It's great to cascade down the edges. Um, you can see it here. Look at that yellow foliage. And, you know, here's your quick cheat. If you wanted something instant, instead of buying a little plant like this, well, guys, just go and buy a hanging basket. Take the clips off it. Take it out and plant it in the garden. It looks like it's been there for 10 years. And it works. Okay, so if we're looking for that tropical feel, um, if that's what we're wanting to uh, include, then consider plants like this that you would combine with it. Okay? Contrasting textures. We've got the beautiful red alternanthra here. This is the red prince. We'll grow very happily with that. And if I took it one step further and I need to grab another plant, so you hang in there, boys. Just you stay right there. Sit, Ubu, sit. Stay. Right. Good dog. All right. So I am now going to bring in some extra foliage and textures, and I think I will bring in my Blechnum fern. Look. So that's where we get to play with the textures. Guys, this could be a pot. This could literally be a pot. This could be a little corner of your front patio. That, that's, that's all it, it could be. It doesn't have to be anything huge. Uh, but this is where we get to play with these textures. So never forget the most commonest common plants. And when I'm talking common plants, I'm talking something like this. I oh, know. But what tropical garden? Well, it just wouldn't be a tropical garden if it didn't have this. Um, also, this is the common alternanthra, but look what it does. I mean, come on. It's not the... Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I do battle to plant this plant in my garden, I will tell you. But nothing quite does and gives you that impact. With this blacknum around it, against there, the red is incredibly powerful. Also, guys, when considering plants for shade, do not forget the aglonomas. Now, aglonomas, um, you're generally going to buy them from the indoor section at your local builders, but they are incredibly versatile. So you get so many different varieties, most of them quite compact, um, great as bathroom plants, but look at the different foliage that you get to play with. So remember I said, you've got to bring in the white. You've got to bring in white to pick up in those dark spaces. If this was deep inside the bed, this was right in the front. This was just popping through. Hmm, do you see that depth? Do you see your, your eye immediately goes to the white? Really great as focal points. Really, really good. Um, and incredibly tough. They don't like a lot of water. Most times people kill aglonomas, true story, by overwatering them because they've got a cane like stem and they've got a very thick fleshy foliage um, and stems that store a lot of water and most times as an indoor plant well this thing succumbs to severe deaths by overwatering severe okay um, there's another plant that I want to share with you which is uh, in completely inexpensive and a great plant to use if you are wanting to create that tropical look and we spoke about white we spoke about textures and I want to show you what impact happens when we add that. Dianella. It's a white, perennial, um, strap-like leafed ground cover. You will know this plant. You've seen it growing on the sides of the road. They use it as a, as a, as a filler plant um, in loads of the municipalities and landscaping, but it works so beautifully. And if I took that, and I'm going to leave that plant there. Look at it just popping through. And if I took that and I added somewhere behind it, Oh, mama, come to daddy. Look at it. Look at the colors. Look. Without it? Yeah. Mm. It's one of those, you know, when you ask someone, would you like a cup of tea and you get a, huh? 
That, that, that's what this looks like. Um, it's okay, but when we add bling in the form of the broad, powerful red against the contrast of these strap-like leaves, the white peeping out just in the back, oh my soul, and then a little bit of yummy zing for the softness and the gentleness of the tropical. Gosh, guys, come on, I need to go planting. Man, it's so, so, so many nice combinations. Okay, and then another great plant, and it was in the slideshow. This is not the greatest specimen, but guys, this is your common asparagus, your cat's tail asparagus. Grows, grows anywhere. And I'm actually going to put it on the side here because really this thing will grow anywhere. Um, it, uh, it has these beautiful long plumes. It gets little red berries. Seriously drought resistant, can grow in semi-shade, can grow in the full, full sun. And it does as well just give you that beautiful contrast and textures. Do not forget our lovely anthuriums. Now, so many of us get gifted these as house plants, and, oh, and then what? Well, then when it's finished as a house plant, you take it and put it into the garden. Because believe it or not, the anthuriums make a great garden plant, especially in semi shade, under dappled, under the trees, as long as you followed those principles of mine. Um, they cunny do it, need. They've got those textures that we're looking for. Um, and they give us that powerful impact of the broad leaves and what they can do. So, you see, when we start adding broad leaves, something happens. Something magical happens. Okay, so, yeah, there is life after a houseplant, believe it or not. <laughs> okay, um, folks, most times, and I want you to consider this, because most times you are going to have to do a bit of searching. Yeah. You, you, you're going to have to scratch. And, and when I say scratch, because a lot of these plants that you are wanting to use will most likely come from the indoor section at your local builders. Okay. Now and then you will find some of them growing and displayed on the outside. Remember, if they do come from the indoor section, that you are taking a plant that has been grown in controlled conditions controlled humidity, controlled temperatures. So when you move it out and plant it into the garden, take a little extra care of it. Give it an extra watering, okay? Mist it down on really, really hot days, especially if you're in the high felt and you don't have that humidity. Do that because it's just going to help the plants. Um, and be prepared to be curious and play <laughs> like that. Guys, I am itching to garden. I don't know about you, but I am itching to garden. I am ready to rock and roll because I have now inspired myself to want to go and garden, which I don't quite know if that was actually what I was meant to do here today, but um, never mind. It's happened. It's happened. Um, and uh, I know it's been a lot. I'm throwing a lot of plant names around, but remember, you can always rewind, pause, and listen to what I said. And if you don't get it, you can always ask us. Um, Remember that there are a lot of, there is a lot of great info also on the Builder's blog and the Builder's YouTube channel, which will cover a lot of these plants that I've spoken about already. Okay, so do, do check that out. And it's all about being playful. And when you are shopping, I urge you, when you are shopping, do what I do here. Because I do that when I go shopping. I put that plant and I'll fetch that plant and I'll put it next to it and I'll say, now, what do you look like? Are you going to work together? Play with the plants. And remember, in order to achieve boldness, you need large groups. Okay. Odd numbers. Threes, fives, nines. Okay. Right. And never be afraid, never, never be afraid to add in a little bit of bright colour. Oh, bright, bright, the orange are coming. Uh, Denier de Lance. Um, but look at, look at the orange. Look how beautiful it works. I mean, yeah, that looks good. That looks cool, but bang. Okay. And yes, we into, we starting to go into autumn, guys, which means that your impatience in your, in your high areas and if you're in areas that receive frost, 
are going to be doing their last little flurry of, um, of their summer show. If you want to get another, another little show out of them before we go into the winter, give them a light haircut, give them a bit of that awesome plant food, and um, they'll come back again. And if you are in the cold areas, remember that as soon as the first cold snap comes, you would need to consider replacing them with something else. There are options. Your primulas will be there, um, which are great for that tropical look. And of course, violas. You can also use which don't mind the cold at all. So oh, there's so much, there's so much. But impatients, don't forget them. As my grandmother used to call them, the impatients, the impatients. Now, if you're still needing some more inspiration, guys, if you're still needing them, please do pop into your local builders when you get your plants and grab a copy of our latest magazine. This is our March issue, guys, and it is full from page to page with the most beautiful, inspiring, articles, information to empower you to become a better gardener. We've got a beautiful story on the, on the allure of the agave, which is quite powerful. Use it uh, in your garden. Use it in pots as focal points. Um, also, we feature a stunning garden in Benoni, uh, which has some really, really cool ideas in there. And I really wanted to steal some of them there. Um, and of course, what to do now, what to prune, what to plant, uh, what you should be harvesting and what you should be sowing in order to get a great winter garden. And then, of course, for all of those that are growing their own subsistence, farmers on the, on the rise, guys, our Grow to Eat magazine has amazing tips on how to harvest and get the best of your herbs and also how to make sure that you can then um, preserve them for the coming winter months. There's a great article on garden design of your veggie gardens, as well as some awesome yummy recipes. And of course, what to plant, what to harvest and how to use it. Guys, it's all in there. It's all available to you. Um, oh, and there's a great article on foraging. So if you want to become a forage expert, we tell you what plants you can forage and what you can't um, and what to eat and what not to eat. Uh, but guys, it's all there. And remember, it's also on the Builders blog. So where do you find the blog? Well, it's www.builders.co.za. And um, great articles there, excellent DIY videos, um, and a whole lot of inspiration too. So I'm off to do some tropical gardening. I don't know about you, but uh, some section of the garden is possibly going to get slashed and burnt in the next few days to make space for some more tropical splendor. Till next time, take care of you and yours. Most importantly, happy gardening.